All right, good afternoon. Uh, we're we're going to get started. Um, thank you for coming and welcome uh, to today's event of uh, Repairing Our Legacy, Native Nations Co-Management and the Future of Federal Public Lands, sponsored by the Coleman P. Burke Center for Environmental Law and the Social Justice Law Center. Uh, a couple quick uh, administrative matters uh, for folks that need CLE credit. There's sign-in uh, and the form that you need to return uh, just outside in the hall. Uh, for students that need to sign in for the Race Law and Society seminars, there's a sign-in sheet uh, in the back corner. Uh, also, one quick announcement. On April 10th at 4.30, uh, the Burke Center will be hosting uh, Judge Margaret McCown. Uh, who'll be speaking, she will be speaking on the environmental legacy of William O. Douglas. Uh, she has a new book out on Justice Douglas uh, and his work uh, on environmental law. Uh, and more information about that is on our website. Um, today, I'm, I'm particularly pleased and honored to be able to introduce our speaker, Professor Monty Mills, who is the Charles I. Stone Professor of Law and Director of the Native American Law Center at the University of Washington School of Law. Uh, he's previously taught at the University of Montana. Uh, he served for 10 years as Director of the Legal Department for the Southern Ute Indian Tribe. Uh, his books include A Third Way, Decolonizing the Laws of Indigenous Cultural Protection, and he is co-author of what I think we can say is the leading case book on um, American Indian law. Uh, he also very conveniently arranged for this to be an incredibly timely event. Uh, yesterday, um, uh, the White House uh, announced, among other things, uh, that President Biden was designating uh, the Aviqua Ame National Monument, uh, which, according to the White House, is intended to honor tribal nations and indigenous peoples by protecting the sacred Nevada landscape and its historically and scientifically important features while conserving our public lands and growing America's outdoor recreation economy. Uh, and today, Professor Mills uh, will be speaking with us on repairing our legacy, Native, Native Nations co-management in the future of federal public lands. Um, that's enough for me because I know many of you think you hear enough from me already. So without any further ado, I'm pleased to, to welcome Professor Mills. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Adler, Burke Center, and all the faculty and staff, and thank you all for being here. I know it helped that you got a good lunch, um, but I appreciate you showing up anyway. Um, also wanna say uh, thanks for getting me to Cleveland for my first time. Uh, yeah, I didn't even get out of the airport before I learned this was home to my two favorite things, or two of my favorite things, Superman and duct tape. So <laughs> it's already been an educational experience. Um, so I'm honored to be here to talk a little bit about uh, issues I've been working on at least for the last few years in uh, with particular focus. As Professor Adler mentioned, I've spent my career working on behalf of tribes and tribal sovereignty, but especially over recent years, I've been focusing on what I think is, as evidenced by the developments yesterday, uh, a coming perhaps revolution in the management of our federal public lands. And I like to, I've coined this talk, Repairing Our Legacy, um, for reasons we'll get into, I think there's uh, a long history of separation and exclusion of Native nations from our federal public lands. But I also think it's important to recognize that federal public lands and the public land estate are our national legacy. And it is a pretty remarkable thing that our nation holds that estate in trust for all of us as Americans. And what better way to perhaps fulfill and repair our legacy than restoring the connections as a legal, practical, and really effective manner of the people who are across those landscapes first. So that's really the focus of this particular talk. And what I'd like to do is set a little bit of the background as it relates to the history and context of federal Indian law and public lands, uh, histories that are directly intertwined and inseparable, but also in many ways have been treated as separate and distinct over time. And particularly in the context of those of you here for the Race, Law, and Society seminar, where we can talk a little bit about the ways in which race and the law have played a role in the separation and exclusion uh, of both concepts from federal Indian law, but also Native people from uh, the, the federal public land estate. Uh, certainly, a lot in the news lately, over the last few decades in particular, and especially over the last few years about modern conflicts. I'm focusing here on two areas of conflict, those related to treaty rights, both before the United States Supreme Court and elsewhere, 
but also more broadly than conflicts over particular sites of importance to indigenous peoples. And there is some overlap, obviously, between those two areas, but certainly not perfect overlap in terms of treaty rights, conflicts over treaty rights and conflicts over sacred sites. And then lastly, really, uh, it was coincidence, but it worked out well that um, there are stories in the news just this week about where we stand now, where things may be headed, and offer a little bit of thought about perhaps how uh, federal public lands might move forward, as evidenced by the proclamation yesterday and continuing initiatives on the part of the current administration uh, to reinvest in tribal connections, knowledge, management, and authority as a resource <laughs> for the management of, of federal public lands. Uh, before we dive in, just a couple of quick things I want to say. Number one, uh, offering my perspectives, I am not native, I'm not an indigenous person. I've worked on behalf of tribes my whole career, and I come at it from that perspective, a legal policy perspective, but I don't speak on behalf of tribes or tribal people. Uh, number two, I will use the terms Indian tribe, which is obviously not the perfect or ideal term to refer to groups of indigenous peoples, but it is the legal term of art under federal law. Title 25 of the United States Code is called Indians, and Indian country refers to reservations. I'll also use Native American, Indigenous peoples, Native nations, but I encourage you as you use those terms and think about them to think about how to uh, appropriately use them. So I always like to start uh, my at least American Indian law classes by asking where we should begin. And oftentimes folks will say, well, maybe 1776. Or maybe 1609, right? Or maybe 14 whatever, 92. There's a song about that one, so generally people remember that. <laughs> but I always encourage folks to maybe start at the beginning, which, at least according to indigenous peoples, is time immemorial. And the presence of indigenous peoples across the continent since the beginning, for millennia, Folks have been on the continent exercising what we might, might now call sovereignty, although I think that in and of itself is sort of a European, Western colonial term for thinking about governance. But it's important to recognize that in terms of cultures and governance and rules and laws and connections and societies, indigenous peoples have been on the continent since time immemorial. And that, as a starting point, provides perhaps a different lens, a different perspective for thinking about the development of the law and conflicts that have come thereafter. And especially as we think about the federal public lands and the process by which the United States acquired territory, disposed of territory, and retained territory, starting from this particular point provides a whole different lens through which we might understand that entire process. And in particular, the role of both the law and race and the law in that dispossession of what since time immemorial was something akin to this landscape. Of course, the arrival of folks here from Europe brought with it a whole different legal tradition, a whole different worldview, a whole different perspective. And as we will see through the evolution of what we now know as the area of federal Indian law, that's really been defined by two kind of competing theories. One represented here is really a nation-to-nation -nation relationship that European countries brought as a matter of international law and interacting with other sovereigns on a treaty basis as a tool of international law and negotiated on a peer-to-peer -peer basis to recognize shared interests, boundaries, avoid conflicts, negotiate peace, etc. And even in the earliest decisions of the United States Supreme Court, trying to answer questions about the status of Indian tribes within the United States Chief Justice Marshall recognized that that has been the tradition of the United States, even at that early point in time, to deal with tribal nations as nations, respect their rights as nations, and to offer the protection that has been negotiated through those time-honored arrangements of treaties, both in the European tradition and then the tradition that the United States stepped into. Of course, with the founding of the United States, I also usually have picture round at the start of my classes. Anybody recognize this gentleman? Thought the front row might. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Heavy hitters in the front row today. Yeah. That, John Marshall. That's Chief Justice John Marshall. Yes. He, the author of what we refer to uh, as the Marshall Trilogy, really the foundational Supreme Court decision setting forth the basic principles on which all of federal Indian law would evolve. And, I trust most all of you are familiar with at least one of those, 
uh, Johnson versus Macintosh and the doctrine of discovery, right? And if we think about that case in particular, we can see the roots of some of the other theories of federal Indian law, the relationship between the United States and tribe. If you think about how Marshall described what would happen if lands were left in the hands of tribal people. To leave those lands in their hands would be to leave them a wilderness, right? To avoid progress and development. And to justify the new and different rule that Marshall came up with for acquiring ultimate title on behalf of the United States, Marshall looked at the characters and habits of indigenous people and really rooted in the earliest decisions of the United States Supreme Court about native nations ideas of tribal people as savages and uncivilized and not abiding by other rules of civilized religion and nations. All of that is a counterpoint to the treatment of tribes as nations and treaty rights and sort of the sovereign to sovereign relationship, which Marshall also addressed in later decisions, particularly the second two of the Marshall trilogy, the Cherokee cases, both Cherokee Nation versus Georgia and Worcester versus Georgia, in which Marshall came back to this idea that tribes really are nations, albeit domestic dependent nations, sort of the catchphrase, the takeaway from Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. As much as anything else, the rest of federal Indian laws an attempt to define those three words. And for the century since, decisions of the United States Supreme Court, actions of the United States Congress have sought to define what domestic dependent nations mean as a matter of federal Indian law. You can see in that term itself, the word dependent. Now for Marshall, I think at this time, that notion of dependency tied back to the ideas of protection in a treaty relationship, one state to another, protecting their boundaries and looking out for their best interests. And at the time, who was it that Marshall was really thinking about in terms of protecting these tribes? From states like Georgia, who denied the existence of tribes at all especially tribes like the Cherokee Nation who are within Georgia's boundaries. Over time, however, that notion of dependency came to involve other conceptions, and really the conceptions that Marshall had sort of alluded to in Johnson versus McIntosh about savagery, uncivilized nature, those types of things came to be incorporated into an idea of dependency that really justified further federal actions down the road. Importantly, though, Marshall also relied on that theory of dependency and the treaty relationship to confirm and establish the trust relationship of the United States on behalf of trust. As he described it like a guardian to its war. Right? The fiduciary relationship that the United States holds to tribes, both in terms of protecting them, but also in terms of looking out for their best interests. And finally, uh, the last sort of foundational piece from these cases was the recognition that the relationship between the United States and Native nations was an exclusive one, exclusive of state authority. And that efforts by the state of Georgia, for example, to interfere with the treaty promises between the United States and the Cherokee Nation were repugnant to the Constitution and laws of the United States because they sought to interfere with that exclusive treaty and trust relationship that the United States had established, relying on those European legal traditions of international law and treaties on a sovereign to sovereign basis. And it really was from this basis then that federal Indian law continued to evolve. And that the negotiation of treaties, the acquisition of territory, and the expansion of the United States continued. For even though Marshall and the United States Supreme Court recognized the Cherokee Nation was a domestic dependent nation, the United States Congress and at the time President Andrew Jackson sought to remove them and other tribes from the region. So the practice built on those legal traditions resulted in the removal, exclusion, and acquisition of lands from tribes and the dispossession of their interests. Now, you can find how that happened in regions you might be familiar with, and the treaties pursuant to which lands were acquired from the tribes in this particular region. The Treaty of Greenville, very small there on the top, 1795, is really the eastern part where we stand, I think, in the city of Cleveland the way that the United States acquired that from the Wyandotte and other tribes in the region. And the western part on the other side of the river was a treaty about 10 years later in 1805. First one ended the war and military conflict between the United States and the tribes really acquired the Northwest Territories, really the first significant acquisition of United States territory to the west and to the north. 
And then the second sought to continue to avoid conflict with the tribes. But it's from this basis then that we're all here today and the negotiation of treaties to acquire those lands from the tribes on behalf of the United States. That was followed, of course, by a whole series of acts and efforts on the part of the United States to carry out what would become the process of manifest destiny and the expansion across the continent. But in order to do that, it had to be done in some slightly orderly fashion. And one of the first ordinances passed, particularly after the Northwest Territory, was one specifically focused on how the process of disposition of these lands would work. And in order to dispose of lands, you've got to know where they are. And you've got to figure out where those parcels may line up, where people might have claims, and which territories you've acquired and which territories you still need to acquire. So Congress set out a whole series of procedures for that to happen. Surveyors crossing the Northwest Territory to begin with, and then eventually the entire country to lay out baselines, meridians, grids, to map the entire territory acquired by the United States, which if you think about it, is a pretty remarkable thing. Laying down a series of squares across a territory that would eventually become the continental United States and look like this and doesn't fit very well into a square box. That's a pretty enormous project on the part of the United States to map and grid through township section and range all the territories that they would acquire. But it, I think, highlights the importance of the acquisition in knowing the territories where the United States could acquire from indigenous peoples and then dispose or retain thereafter once they had acquired those territories from tribes. <coughs> now you might say, well, what about that big purchase we did from France in 1803? Something happened, one of the bigger real estate transactions, right? Well, what was it that the United States acquired in 1803 from France? I mean, they bought a big chunk of territory, right? But all of those lands were already populated and being used by indigenous peoples at the time in 1803. So what did they get? Well, they got the right to go out and negotiate with those tribes to acquire that territory, right? As Marshall said in, in Johnson versus McIntosh, the exclusive right to extinguish aboriginal title, either through purchase or conquest. And for the most part, it was purchase through treaties to acquire that territory. So we got from France the right to go out and do that, but in 1803, at the time that happened, most of that territory was already being used and occupied. Of course, the Western progress of the United States, fueled by a whole number of things, uh, proceeded. And this is a painting from the time, uh, American Progress is the title of this painting, which I think aptly represents, you know, the picture's worth a few words, I think. But if you look carefully, you can kind of see the visual representation of what Marshall talked about in Johnson versus McIntosh, right? To leave lands in the hands of the tribes would be to leave them a wilderness. You can see the herds of bison running off into the distance, along with indigenous folks being chased off by railroads and telegraph lines and stagecoaches and the law in the hands of American progress as she floats across the frontier. And that theory, again, goes back, I think, in many ways to the earliest conceptions as a legal matter of what tribes represented and what their presence on the landscape meant, which, as Johnson said, or as Marshall said in Johnson versus McIntosh, was really not using the land. It wasn't progressing or enhancing the land. Rather, it was leaving it a wilderness. So therefore, it justifies, in the name of progress, removing tribal folks from the land itself without a recognition of the other values in the landscape, in the natural world that tribal folks may possess, unrecognized by either Chief Justice Marshall or American progress thereafter. So from the 1800s to the end of formal treaty making in 1871, even thereafter, Three, over 300 treaties negotiated prior to 1871, the acquisition of much of the continental United States, even thereafter, due largely to a political dispute between the House and the Senate in 1871 and the passage of a law that said, we're not making treaties anymore. Even thereafter, Congress still ratified a number of agreements, sort of treaty substitutes with tribes, not technically treaties, but still have the same force of law 
to acquire territory and secure various other national interests in the name of American progress. In particular, the Peace Commission of 1867 and 68, really the last sort of big push of formal treaty making across the West, chartered by then President Grant, and including such famous or infamous figures as William Tecumseh Sherman, among others, team of folks went across the West to negotiate treaties and really open up the frontier as they saw it for non-Indian settlers, non-Indigenous folks to continue the march through the West and settlement, et cetera. Treaties with the Navajo, with the Ute, with Shoshone Bannock tribes at Fort Hall, with the Crow in Montana, a number of treaties negotiated in this 1867-68 period. And if you look across those treaties, you can see similarities among the different treaties that were negotiated, the templates that were brought by federal negotiators, often subject to some changes in the terms of negotiation, often represented the final deals that were made. And why was it so important that those treaties be negotiated then? Well, the United States had particular interest in constructing infrastructure, especially railroads at the time, to reach the West, serve the gold rush that was already going on in California, and continue the progress of America toward the West Coast. Now, after acquiring those lands, of course, they had to finance, the United States had to support the construction of massive infrastructure projects, transcontinental railroads. And they did that by disposing of those same lands to railroad companies. And you can see here lands that were disposed up to 20 miles on either side of the proposed route in an effort to support and finance the construction of the railroads across the country. So the acquisition of those lands from tribal people through the negotiation of treaties rooted in that legal tradition of European legal theory directly related then to the acquisition, then subsequent disposition of that territory from the United States to private companies like railroads, which continues to have longstanding legacy effects on public lands to this day. And the checkerboard relationship of lands granted to railroads continues to cause problems for access, management, private public conflicts. There's litigation happening right now in Wyoming about corner crossing and the ability of citizens of the United States to access public lands because of this history of acquisition and disposition of the public land estate, the United States territory to railroads to facilitate this process. The upshot, of course, of all of this as it relates to public lands is that you cannot separate the history of public lands that were retained by the United States for the benefit of all of us from that history of dispossession and exclusion of tribal people from those lands. And this map shows much of the Western United States with reference to lands of the United States Forest Service, those lighter green portions there. The lines there, the broader lines, are maps of where treaties were negotiated, land sessions by tribes across the West. And you can, this is actually the United States Forest Service website, Tribal Connections. You can go into this map and track the sessions that were made by individual tribes and individual treaties that then became particular national forests or particular metro areas. We don't even have on this map, you can see, for example, Yellowstone National Park there, the square in the middle of the Forest Service in the upper left corner of Wyoming. But we don't have BLM lands mapped here, be similar. Other Fish and Wildlife Service lands, refuges, would fit on this map as well, and national park lands as well. The crosshatch lands are those retained by tribes, present day reservations. But you can see the connections that tribes have had to much of public lands, particularly in the West, even though this history of dispossession and exclusion has resulted in their isolation on reservations, perhaps far from territories that they once used and possessed and ceded in treaties. But importantly, at least from a tribal perspective, is that those connections weren't severed by this history. In many instances, they were retained through the negotiation of specific rights and treaties. But even without the specific reservation of treaty rights, these connections between present day tribes and their ancestral territories remain. Unfortunately, though, the nature of public land law and management hasn't acknowledged that in many instances. And at least traditionally, public lands were really viewed as separate and distinct from this history. 
with federal agencies like the Forest Service or like the BLM being charged with their management on behalf of all Americans to balance interests or sustain yield in the case of the Forest Service, really produce for the broader national interest without reference in many of those organic acts to this history or the continuing connection of tribes or the historical connection of tribes. And in essence, what happened was that the public land estate, the management of public lands grew up really separately from federal Indian law and tribal interests, despite this inextricably linked history of the lands itself. And it's only been in recent years that we've begun to see the reestablishment of some of those connections, but it's come with many conflicts. I mean, the upshot, obviously, right? Public lands are tribal lands. They have been since time immemorial, but they haven't been treated that way, both as a legal matter and as a practical matter. And it's only now that we're beginning to see meaningful ways in which those connections are being restored and reinvigorated and protected and asserted on behalf of tribal nations. And there's two main areas of modern conflicts that we've seen. One, obviously, is litigation over treaty rights. And certainly not a modern conflict. If you think back to the Winans case in 1905, the United States Supreme Court for over a century has recognized the continuing vitality of treaty rights, their importance as a property right to tribal people, notwithstanding statehood, notwithstanding the equal footing doctrine, notwithstanding private property rights that may be established by virtue of statehood and state law. And yet, litigation has continued over the extent and scope and protection of the exercise of those treaty rights. In the Northwest, that's meant that at least for the last half century, since the Bolt decision in 1974, or the Bologna decision before that, tribes have been actively involved in the management of the fishery resource. That has been a successful lesson in tribal co-management of a publicly shared resource. And one in which many folks, I think, would acknowledge that the salmon resource wouldn't be what it is today, it might not even be around today were it not for tribal efforts in sustaining and protecting that resource. Most recently, of course, litigation over the installation of culverts as a block to salmon passage and destruction of the fish runs was recognized by the, United, by the Ninth Circuit and summarily affirmed by, the, by an equally divided Supreme Court as a breach of that treaty reserve right, not just to fish in these streams, but to take fish. That in order for that right to exist, there actually had to be fish there to take. And then if the state of Washington were going to continue to install culverts, or at least wasn't going to fix the culverts fast enough to ensure that salmon populations could continue, then they were in breach of the treaty. So important legal rights have been secured and protected and recognized by the United States Supreme Court by virtue of treaty rights being the supreme law of the land under our Constitution, and have provided the basis for, in some areas, important avenues for tribes to be engaged in the management of shared resources. We've also seen broader efforts on behalf of tribes to protect and assert treaty rights in other contexts. This is that's the Crow Reservation there, that crosshatch area in Bighorn National Forest in north central Wyoming. That was the scene of the conflict that arose in Herrera versus Wyoming, which went to the United States Supreme Court in 2016, in which the Crow tribe asserted, well, Mr. Herrera asserted because he was the one being criminally prosecuted, but the Crow tribe showed up too, and asserted that their treaty had reserved them the right to hunt in the Bighorn National Forest. Even though Wyoming, even in 2016, argued that their statehood meant that all treaty rights in their boundaries ended when they became a state. And if you read Wyoming's briefs in that particular case, you can see all the echoes of that legacy of progress toward statehood, toward the United States, as a basis for ending treaty rights at the time Wyoming became a state. They said the path to progress ended upon statehood. And that's when treaty rights should have ended too. But the United States Supreme Court disagreed. They said, no, we look to the language of the treaty. We apply our rules of interpretation for the language of the treaty. And those rules require that we try to understand how the tribe would have understood that treaty language. We interpret that treaty liberally in favor of the tribe. And we resolve ambiguities in favor of the tribe. And if we look at it that way, then these treaty rights still remain. 
unless and until Congress says clearly that they don't. So even in modern times, those continuing but time-honored and long-recognized treaty rights remain powerful avenues through which tribes can assert protections for off-reservation resources, particularly in the public lands like national forests, and provide a basis for a tribe to make an argument about their authority to manage those resources in conjunction with federal and state resource managers as well. But it's not just treaty rights where we've seen these issues come up. We've also seen a number of conflicts over sacred sites. This is a map, Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. All of those red dots are oil and gas wells. Navajo Nation is the reservation there just to the west, and right in the middle is Chaco Cultural National Historical Park, which, if you haven't been, highly recommended. It. It's a remarkable place, and it is one in which the long-standing connections of indigenous peoples to this continent are evident and clear, which is quite powerful, but obviously under significant threat for a variety of reasons, not just from activities of the United States, although the United States and the Bureau of Land Management played a significant role in approving resource management plans that authorized all of those oil and gas wells, but also a place where a number of tribes, particularly the Pueblos of the Rio Grande Valley in New Mexico, have long-standing connections and interests in protecting. And so how is it that those tribes might be involved and engaged in protecting Chaco Canyon and surrounding resources? Well, they've had to work through that resource management planning process of the BLM, which is underway and has been underway for a while now, almost a decade, to try and assert protection. They've worked with the Navajo Nation, and the Navajo Nation itself has sought to assert additional protection. But there hasn't been really any other basis outside of those federal administrative procedures and federal public land laws for the tribes to really assert protections for Chaco Canyon in a meaningful way. Remains to be seen whether that changes, particularly given recent initiatives of the current administration focused on what they call honoring Chaco and protecting the area from further oil and gas development and working to protect or develop other measures to involve tribal voices in the its protection going forward. But that's certainly not the only place. Badger Two Medicine area in Montana, a forest service area within the Helena Lewis and Clark National Forest, a place of significant power to the Blackfeet Nation, and a place where for years the Blackfeet has sought to protect and prevent oil and gas drilling through litigation, through planning processes, through engagement with the Forest Service, through the designation under the National Historic Preservation Act of that area as a traditional cultural district, which was a strong basis on which then the federal agencies could reject and ultimately cancel the oil and gas leases that the Blackfeet were challenging. Now that's remained subject to litigation and the power of contract rights bound up in oil and gas leases has been the basis on which some courts have overturned those cancellations. But the tribal efforts to protect that landscape have been bound up in those same long-standing challenges, both historically and legally, that have invigorated federal public land and federal Indian law from the beginning. Oak Flat is another place. The Apache Stronghold case continues there. And obviously, the Bears Ears in southeast Utah is one of the, I think, game changers in terms of thinking about how tribes might play a different role in the management of federal public lands going forward. The designation of Bears Ears National Monument specifically included, it was the first proposal from tribes themselves to use the Antiquities Act to protect a place of tribal importance, specifically included and recognized the tribal connections, historic and continuing to the area as a basis for protection and included procedures by which the federal agencies responsible for managing that landscape would work with tribes and tribal governments in its management. Now, political winds changed, things on the ground changed, but it's now been restored by the current administration with many of those same protections in place. Whether legal challenges about the authority of a president to change under the Antiquities Act proclamations and designations of a prior president, those remain. But at least as a substantive matter, I think Bears Ears and the original proclamation 
rooted in and based on tribal values and protections was remarkable in terms of the potential for at least that method of engagement going forward. And as we saw just yesterday, President Biden really relied on those same principles in the designation of the National Monument in Nevada. So you can really think about, I think, the current state of conflict over the management and use of public lands in terms of a clash of values. And from the very beginning, at least as a legal matter, going all the way back to Johnson versus McIntosh, the connection and value in which tribal people hold these landscapes has been not recognized, disregarded, largely erased from the story of public lands. And it's only because tribes are now in the position to tell that story themselves in meaningful ways that those values are beginning to restore connections to the landscape. And the history of federal public land law and management really comes from that other place, uh, erasure of connection to the land on the part of indigenous peoples. The view that under federal law, other interests need to be protected and balanced, multiple use. In addition, the federal administrative state, the requirements of federal law don't provide, or at least historically haven't provided, many meaningful avenues for tribes to engage on a government to government basis, notwithstanding the trust relationship that federal Indian law has recognized really from the beginning of the United States. Now, there has been an evolution in terms of tribal consultation and the need to engage with tribes and seek their input in how those management decisions are made. But to hear tribal leaders say how that process has gone, really not that well. That's changing, but over time at least, consultation has been not sufficient in, many tribal, in, in the view of many tribes to really meaningfully affect federal decision making and federal management. So this sort of clash has re been reflected in the legal procedures, the legal avenues available for tribal management and authority over public lands. But I think it really reflects that long-standing conflict between the recognition of tribes as nations, as sovereigns on a government to government basis in treaties and that conflicting notion of tribes as dependent or savage, uncivilized, etc. But things are changing. And particularly given the presence of Native people in positions of leadership across the Department of the Interior and really across the federal government, we're seeing meaningful ways in which the federal approach to the management of public lands and resources is evolving. That picture round, I assume everybody knows Secretary Holland. The other? That's Chuck Sands, the new head of the National Park Service. He's the first Native American to lead the National Park Service. So having folks in these positions who, positions of leadership who understand the nature of the treaty and trust relationship and can really enliven and commit to the specific statutory requirements like under NHPA, but also begin to reshape the way in which the federal agencies involve and engage in consultation, which is happening and provide manuals and guidance as a matter of federal policy that specifically call for the meaningful engagement of tribes in what they've termed co-stewardship. And happy to debate the differences between co-management and co-stewardship, but at least as it stands, the federal government is committed to a policy of co-stewardship by recognition of the joint secretarial order issued last year between the secretaries of interior and agriculture, which really opens the door for rethinking the ways in which federal land management agencies, those in the interior and ag, like Forest Service, BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, engage with tribes. And this secretarial order comes from a position starting with the trust relationship and the obligations of the United States to tribal people and recognition of the history of public lands as a place where tribes have long-standing connections. And it calls on agencies to engage various authorities for engaging in co-stewardship. Each of the agencies have then subsequently issued their own policies, promoting and seeking opportunities within their legal authorities to engage tribes in co-stewardship decisions and management of their resources. Maybe most importantly, 
Well, the Forest Service has done their own. They were a little bit behind the game in terms of the interior agencies and just recently issued this uh, plan uh, striving to incorporate more tribal voices and laying out the Forest Service's approach to tribal co-stewardship opportunity. Most importantly, perhaps, has been guidance from the agency's legal counsel, which for a while has been a place where the legal nature of tribal authority to co-steward or manage public lands has been an issue about the non-delegation doctrine or sub-delegation doctrine and the authority of federal governments to empower tribes to have meaningful authority as it relates to federal decisions. Well, the DOI solicitor and the general counsel of the Department of Agriculture have now put out detailed guidance for their agencies about existing legal authorities that can be used to empower tribal coast stewardship. Now, there's still some gray areas there, and they talk about subdelegation and some of the legal challenges that agencies may face, but there's a lot of room for engaging these authorities short of running into those historical legal challenges. In addition, the consultation guidance from the current administration has been updated, and in particular, the Department of Interior has issued new policies that call for a consensus-seeking model of tribal consultation on any issue that may have tribal implications. And this is far more detailed guidance, and the objective of seeking consensus is far more substantive than the policies that Interior has had before related to consultation. It remains to be seen, of course, how all of these policy directives will play out and be implemented on the ground, in particular given the political shift that may be happening in the elections coming up in just a few years. But I think the implementation of these in that time period, which we are already seeing at Bears Ears, we're already seeing at Chaco, we're already seeing on the ground in Nevada, really begins to set the path towards sustainable change in concurrence with those policy, guide, those policy changes. The, in conjunction with all of this stuff, Interior issued a, its first report on tribal coast stewardship documenting all of the ways in which agencies within Interior are actually engaged in coast stewardship across the public landscape and across their responsibilities. And while there may be more room for building in that report and offering more opportunities, it at least provides an important marker of the progress that's already been made and that regardless of the political winds that may change, projects that are already underway and continuing will see how much that report expands going forward in light of recent policy guidance and uh, other changes to come. So that provides, I think, a basis for thinking about what the future of public lands management might look like. And as I mentioned, Bears Ears was really a landmark shift in terms of using federal power, at least the power under the Antiquities Act, to both recognize continuing tribal connections to public lands and also protect them while providing an important legal avenue for tribes to engage as partners in the management of those resources as well. So the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition, which was the group of tribes that put together that proposal for Bears Ears National Monument in the first place back in 2015, 2016, has now put together a proposed land management plan for the National Monument. And they've entered into an agreement with the Bureau of Land Management as to how that management is gonna go forward. But this really is a tribally-led approach to management of the landscape on behalf of all of us. So when you think about repairing our legacy, it's not just about the justice associated with addressing and acknowledging the historical and legal exclusion of tribal connections to this landscape. But I think it's also about the substantive management of the resource on our behalf. Because who better to influence how these resources are managed than the folks who've had the longest connection to them with the deepest knowledge and intimate understanding of the ways in which those landscapes work and can work and can be protected and can be sustained going forward. So it's not just about justice, which I think is important too, but it's also about repairing the natural landscape and shifting the perspective of what federal public lands can mean for all of us, from one of disposition and development and extraction to one of maybe a more permanent and sustainable homeland and connection. Will that be where we end up? We'll see. But I think there's no doubt it's a significant change is underway. 
and it remains to be seen how far that revolution in terms of management will go. So thanks for your time. I'm happy to take questions. If you have a question, um, just wait for the microphone so that folks on the recording uh, can get to you and we'll start. Um, so as most of us have seen either on TikTok or on the news, um, Willow Project has been a very, very highly contested issue on social media platforms and news sites. Um, and I was just curious um, what your comments were on that and if you think that the implications of that approval for the Willow Project going forward um, would set back our progress on trying to repair this legacy between federal public lands and the government. Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. I think um, if you haven't seen, maybe it's on TikTok, uh, <laughs> Secretary Holland talk about the decision as it relates to the approval of the Willow Project, I recommend you watch that. Because I think you can see her wrestling with the potential conflict that it poses. Um, and to be clear, I mean, these aren't, tribes are all on one side, or native groups are all on one side, and developers all on the other. And particularly in the case of the Willow Project and other development initiatives in Alaska, it's much more complex than that. So it's, I think, harder to say in that situation and many others, that uh, it is a defeat or a setback for tribal interests or native interests in use of the public lands. Um, what I do think, though, is regardless of the substantive outcome, even the fact that you have the Secretary of the Interior showing up on TikTok or wherever else and talking about what that decision is, what it means, and explaining it, um, as a native person in particular, is an important recognition of those conflicts and tribal or native opposition to a development project like that, right? Historically, like in the Badger Two Medicine, there wasn't even recognition that the tribes would have interest in these development areas at all, right? So even though the substantive outcome may be contested or objected to by a number of tribal groups, I think there's even in that more transparency and recognition of travel interests and connections to the resource. Questions? Thanks. Uh, I, I, thank you so much again for all of this. Um, you, at the end, you were talking about sort of the new system, the code management system, the memorandum of understanding, et cetera. And, uh, I've seen a little bit of that, excuse me, um, with uh, fire suppression management. And, and it really seems like they're, it, it, it actually is going to have real impacts. But I'm wondering, does it really change anything legally? And what I mean by that is, as I think you alluded to this, if the administration changes, this seems to have the effect of essentially executive orders. Mm -hmm. And so that could just be, be gone, except for the set-asides under the Antiquities Act, maybe. Right. But even those, as we've seen, are subject well, to maybe. shift as well, right? Yeah. No, I think that's the, that is the fundamental question about the sustainability of this movement. Because right now it is all a matter of agency policy, secretarial directive, some Antiquities Act proclamations, particularly the ones this week, um, and all that could change. That being said, there have been efforts, particularly by Representative Grijalva in Congress, to bring forth congressional legislation that would at least empower some other ways to approach it. In, in my view, that's been sort of incremental steps as opposed to broader authorities. But that would be, I think, the way in which you could insulate some of this from political changes going forward. The other thing I would say, though, is and why I think the next year and a half-ish are so critical, I do think that if there are efforts underway at some of these places to really meaningfully build structures of it, tribal engagement, either through, like, in the case of the, the monument in Nevada, the proclamation calls for a FACA committee made up of majority tribal representatives to advise in the management and operation of the management. The impacts on the, the, the ground are definitely changing. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the other potential is that if there is implementation that gets far enough along, it's going to be insulated somewhat from political and policy changes at higher levels. Thank you. Yeah. One last super quick question. 
So I was wondering if, if there's been any history of cooperation between the different tribal groups and like the BLM for the private use of federal lands, like grazing for cattle or something like that. Yeah, some. And I think that's an important thing to recognize in the context of co-management or co-stewardship. I mean, tribes have varied interests and multiple tribes have varied interests too. And it's not just about tribes getting to say, we're protecting this area, period but rather tribal engagement and priorities being represented in the management of a particular area, whether that's use, multiple use, and it wouldn't necessarily, particularly because this is all policy and not congressional action, it's not gonna change the mandates that the federal agencies have under their organic acts, right? I think instead what is really being called for is an incorporation of these other trust and treaty responsibilities into the ways in which those agencies carry out those statutory mandates. So it could be that, you know, tribes are advising about the way grazing is carried out and authorizing other uses in particular places. It's not just about conservation. And I think that really gets to the heart of co-stewardship itself. Maybe the resource, in my view, likely is going to be managed better and more sustainably according to some different priorities. But it doesn't mean it's all going to be just protected either as wilderness or national park or whatever else. Thank you, Rome, again, and uh, thanking Professor Mills for his remarks today.